Who here likes a good story? I love stories. And some of my best days were when my boys were little. Every night before bed, we would have a chance to read. And one of our favorites, having boys, <laughs> were the Hardy Boys books. We would read a chapter of night, and if you remember anything about Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew, there was usually a cliffhanger ending to a chapter. And so at the end of the chapter, being a little bit of an artist, I would draw a quick little picture. We've got scores of books now with pictures at the bottom of the page. Who here loves a good story? Well, that is our theme for this summer. God is timeless. And yet our God entered into time. And because he entered time, there is a story. From our human perspective, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. For me, my beginning was birth. My middle is now. There will be, at least on earth, an end. For human history, there is a beginning. Genesis, we covered that last week. There is a middle, and there is a glorious end. The true middle of the scripture is Jesus Christ himself. He is the fulcrum on which all of history turns and changes. But who loves a story? This summer, we are going to be doing the story of God, which means we are going to be doing the story of God and God's people. Thus, this is our story that we are in the midst of, too. Last week, I told you that we're going to use a common image to begin to, to hook and hold things on. It's the phrase, if only. And time and time again, I am going to ask you the question, have you ever heard anybody say, and usually then it's, well, if only God did this, or if only God then did that, then things would be different. And you know, sometimes we, we kind of scapegoat God. If God had done this, or, or sometimes as if we would only do that. And so, I want to give you a few of those because we are part of our way along this journey. Last week, you can go back and watch it. Last week, we focused on Genesis 1 through 11. Today, we pick up at Genesis 12 and cover the rest of the book of Genesis. So a quick sermon, uh, lots of points, and a short time. But here are the if-only questions we asked last week. And it always usually starts when I do this with the words, have you ever heard anybody say, if only God had made everything perfect? God says, I did, but perfect didn't work. If you create beings that are not God and you give them freedom, eventually they will fall. Well, have you ever heard anybody say, well then, how come God just doesn't make everything like one big happy family? God says, I did, but even in the first family, Cain killed his brother Abel. Well, have you ever heard anybody say, how come God doesn't just start all over again? God says, I did. I sent a flood to cover the land, but when the only righteous man in the world got off of the ark, what did Noah do? He planted a vineyard, got drunk, lay naked, humiliated his family. Well, if only we, have you ever heard this? If only we could learn to work better together. <laughs> Yeah, we want to do that, right? I mean, it would be wonderful if we worked better together, but God says, as soon as my people started working together, they thought they could make a tower for themselves with their heads in the clouds, and they thought that they could be like me. This is the beginning of the story of God. Now, last week our theme was this. 
in spite of human sin, God kept coming to his people to redeem their brokenness. So, what kind of brokenness did we see redeemed? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned against God. It caused the fall, but God clothed them with the skin of an animal. Most believe it was a lamb. Therefore, from the very beginning, the blood of the lamb covered God's people. The story of Cain and Abel, it's a horrible story. One brother killing the other out of jealousy, and yet when Abel died, he was the first human to go to heaven. He has been there longer than any other human. When it says in Exodus or in Genesis 6 that God was sorry that he had made humankind on this earth, what happened? The next word was, but Noah. God's heart towards his people. God, Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord and there was a rescue. I told you last week the Tower of Babel, they thought their heads were in the clouds. They thought they could become like God and so God scattered them. Scattered the nations. So where is the grace? Well, this is where we pick up the story today in Genesis chapter 12. And it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is one of the most faithful stories in all of Scripture. God comes to Abram and just says, Go, and Abraham goes. He says, go where? And, neighbor, and God says, essentially, I'll tell you when you get there. <laughs> Imagine the trust that that would take. Just go, and I'll tell you when you arrive. And Abraham went. And what did God promise this man, who was alternately faithful and faithless? We'll see that in a minute. It says, God said to Abram, I will make of you a great nation. Remember, the nations are scattered, but God in His grace is raising up a nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. That is what God calls for all of us. Every blessing that He gives us, we are to turn around and give to others. I will bless those who bless you, and the one that curses you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, you will be blessed. I love that. That call of Abraham, so he just packed up and went. There's brokenness in this world. Nations are divided. But through Abraham, the line of Abraham, which includes now the line of Jesus Christ, through those lines is blessing for a broken world. And when we're tired of a broken world, we got to go back to the old covenant and the new covenant. So, here's very quickly the story of Abram, one of the most faithful people ever. God said go, and without even knowing where, where he was going, he went trusting. So they arrive in the promised land. Canaanites are there, but God is going to bless him, and he does. But in the midst of this, God doesn't, Abraham doesn't fully trust in God. You ever done that? You have this faith, and yet, right? And so listen to the complication that Abram was. So Abram at one point traveled. And when he traveled, he said, my wife, he was 75 when he started this journey. His wife is probably 65, and yet she is beautiful. She goes down to another land, and he says to her, uh, honey, you're so beautiful. If, if we tell them that I'm your husband, they're going to kill me to get you. And so let's do it this way. Let's say you're my brother, and he gives away his wife. Now, God has just promised that he's going to give them Make them a nation out of them. 
which means there's going to be children. And if there's going to be children, what does Abraham immediately do? He gives away his wife. And then God promised a land. One of the next things that he does in Genesis in these first chapters of 12 through like 16, he goes up on a mountain. He says to his nephew Lot, Lot, this whole Middle East is not big enough for the two of us. So you choose which side you want. Now Lot looked at the beautiful side, which included uh, all of the fields and the more beautiful pastures, and he'll said, I take that, uh, which unfortunately for him included Sodom and Gomorrah. But here was Abraham willing to give away the promised land. And then God says, you're going to have children, and Abram and Sarai can't wait. And so they said, well, let's make it happen ourselves. You ever done that? God's promised a blessing, and yet we're trying to make it happen ourselves. And so Abram has a child with the maid. This is crazy. Here he is. He has promised land and children, and he's trying to do everything else instead. But in the story, God is faithful. He promised him land. He promised him children with Sarah. And so he comes to him again, and he changes their name. I love that old song, I will change your name. You shall no longer be called. And then all of these words that we define ourselves by, broken, sorrowful, hurting, grieving, whatever we call ourselves by, in this case he calls Abram, Abraham. He calls Sarai, Sarah. I heard somebody say once that he gave them each Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, gave them each an H from his name. He put his stamp upon them, and they gave them a child. Here he is almost 100 years old, Sarai, almost 90. She laughed in that sense of, wait a minute, Sarah, Abraham, is anything impossible for the Lord? And so they have a child. It is the apple of their eye. There is such joy. And then one day, God comes to Abram, and he puts him to the test. He says, Abram, take your son, and take him to the mountain and sacrifice him there. And Abraham does it. He's learned to walk with the Lord. He's learned that God is faithful. He can't conceive of this. His heart is heavy. This is not, and some people confuse this when they read through this. They give Christians a hard time. Well, your God asked Abraham to sacrifice his own son. No. The point of this is going to be the world asks for the sacrifice of our children. I mean, they did it in the days of Moloch. They killed the children. We do it now to some degree with abortion out of convenience. You know, there are some circumstances. We're not going to get into that, but how many out of convenience sacrifice their own children? That's not the way of God. That's the way of the world, and that's the way of Satan. And so, Abraham, though, he's learned to trust the Lord on this long journey. And so, they go up a mountain. When they put the wood and make an altar out of it, Isaac looks with love in his father's eyes, and he says, Father, the altar is here. Where is the sacrifice? And imagine the trust of Isaac. He allows his father to put him on this. You hear the trust and the faith? It's crazy. I wouldn't invent this story. But when Abraham goes to make the sacrifice, what do we find? We find the blood of the lamb again. That substitute. We saw that with Adam and Eve that even when they sinned, there was a lamb that was there 
They took the skin of the land and covered their sin and their nakedness. We saw that in the story of Cain and Abel last week. That here was Abel, he made a sacrifice that required blood. It's the substitutionary sacrifice. Most believe that what he, it says the first of his, his flock, the, the fatlings of his flock, a lamb. Caught in this thicket are, is a ram, a lamb. And again, there is a substitution for us. Abraham, in the most impossible circumstances, was faithful. And how many of us have this story? We start this story with great faith. Abraham went to a land he didn't know. We started our journey with faith. How many of us have fallen in the midst of that journey? Right? Abraham tried to give away his wife. Abraham tried to give away the promised land. Abraham had children with the maid. But he ends this story in great faith. And that's my prayer for you is, is this reconciling God that we have wants to take the midst of our journey and bless us along the way. Well, Abraham passed away. He went the way of his fathers. That's a common phrase in the Bible. The way of all of this earth. He died. But Isaac grew up. When Isaac was an older man, he and his bride had a child. And actually, she was pregnant. She was finally pregnant. This is one of those stories. Finally, they get pregnant and they have twins. Esau comes out first, this hairy child. And hanging on to his ankle is little Jacob. As they grow up, Esau is the big, strong he-man and gains his father Isaac's favor. Jacob is the more sensitive child. And he gains his mother Rachel's favor. And so here they go, they grow up. And Rebecca, Rebecca's favor. And, and so he gains Rebecca's favor. And as he gains her favor, uh, what begins to happen is the question is who will everything belong to? Through whom will the inheritance run? And this is not just stuff, this is the line of God. The patriarchs have started Abraham, Isaac, and Everybody knows, the oldest one is first, and the oldest one is Esau. And listen to the messiness in all of this. Isaac favored the strong one, Esau. Rebekah favored the gentle, Jacob. And so, to get the blessing, Rebekah and Jacob hatch a plan. One day, while Esau is out hunting, Jacob makes some food. And when Esau comes back, this big strong man says, oh, I'm hungry. I'd give anything for a bowl of soup. And so Jacob says, will you sell me my birth, your birthright for a bowl of soup? And Esau, yeah, I'll sell you uh, my birthright for a bowl of soup. And so Esau has given this to him. But the problem is, there's still the father's blessing. And so Rebecca says this. She says, Jacob, go into your father and ask for his blessing. He says, he'll know it's me. He's going to give that to Esau. And she says, no, no, no. Here's what we're going to do. When you go in there, instead of talking in your Jacob voice, talk in an Esau voice. He goes, okay, but what if he calls me over? Esau is the hairiest man that's ever lived. And so she gives him ironically, the fleece of a lamb, to put over him. And so he walks in the room and says, Hello, Father. Hello, Father. And Isaac says, Who is that? It sounds a little like both Esau and Jacob. And he goes, Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Esau. And he's like, Esau, come a little closer. And he reaches out and puts his hand 
on the fleece that's supposed to be Esau's arm. And he goes, well, I guess you kind of sound like Esau, and you sure feel like Esau. What can I do for you, son? Give me your blessing. So he gives him his blessing, and what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He has the blessing now. So it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he has to run because Esau is none too happy. He's just sold his blessing, and Isaac has given it away. These are not perfect people. And so Jacob runs away. He gets to a place, works for a man named Laban. And while he's working for the man named Laban, he meets the beautiful Rachel. And he's like, may I have your daughter's hand in marriage? He says, yes, of course, but you have to work seven years for her. At the end of seven years, it's the wedding day. And Laban is like, wait a minute. My older daughter Leah still isn't married. Let's pass her off as Rachel. So they put the veil on, marches her down the aisle. This is kind of our modern American image, but marches her down the aisle and marries her off. And that wedding night, when the veil is finally pulled back, he's like, oh my goodness, I married the sister. Well, work seven more years and you can have Rachel. So finally he has the love of his life. But this division that he's created with this sense of favorite wife and not favorite wife will play out just like it did. There, there are generational things that go on. Abraham tried to give away his wife when he went to another country saying, say that you are my sister. Well, Isaac did the same thing with Rebekah. And then that whole favoritism thing, oh, you're my favorite son and you're my favorite son, is now is going to be in the family of Jacob because Leah will ha be fruitful and productive and she will have ten sons just like this. Rachel doesn't have any sons and her heart is broken. But his least favorite wife, I want you to hear the brokenness in all of this. His least favorite wife had ten sons. Finally, Rachel has a son and another son, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, who do you think is dad's favorite? It, parents, doesn't make sense to play favorites. It always backfires. But he did. Joseph, the oldest son of his favorite wife was his favorite. And so he treated him completely differently. He gave him a tetanicolor dream coat. That's Broadway's name for it. But he gave him a coat of many colors. In a world where everything was kind of tan and drab and dyes were rare, he invested in this one son causing incredible jealousy. Joseph didn't help the matter whatsoever. Joseph, what he wound up doing was saying, I had a dream, and God did allow him to interpret dreams. But he said, not tactfully, I had a dream. There were, 11 star there were 12 stars, and 11 of them bowed down to the other one. <laughs> Guess who that one is? I'm the one that one day all of you are going to bow down to. And then he said, a few days later, I had another dream. Stocks of wheat, 12 of them, 11 of them bowed down to me. <laughs> His brothers were so jealous, they were angry. One day they conspired to kill him. One of the brothers, Judah, actually says, wait a minute, rather than just kill him, uh, there goes a passing caravan, let's... Let's sell him to them. Then we'll be rid of him, plus we'll have a little bit of money. He couldn't bring his heart to allow them to kill his brother or his father's favorite child. He didn't want to break his father's heart, but he still wanted him gone. So Joseph gets carried off into slavery in Egypt. And when he gets there, he is sold actually to a good man. The good man's name is Potiphar. And everything goes right. Joseph winds up being a good worker, a man of integrity. And because of that, he rises quickly to be head of the household. 
And so here is Joseph, head of the household, and not only does Potiphar take notice of him, but Mrs. Potiphar takes notice of him. And she likes him. She wants him. She goes in one day when every one of her advances are finally rejected and grabs Joseph by the cloak. And Joseph, instead of dishonoring his master, runs away, pulls out of the cloak, runs away naked. And so here is the dilemma. What are we going to do? Mrs. Potiphar cries out, guess what he tried to do to me? Right? Joseph winds up in prison. Now, if you're Joseph and the line goes from Abraham, Isaac to Jacob, and now kind of through you, how are you feeling about right now? You've been sold into slavery. You've been thrown unjustly into prison. But while he's there, there are a couple of men there that have dreams. They used to work in the king's household. One was the baker. One was the cupbearer. They both had dreams one night, and... Joseph interpreted their dreams before them. Both of you are going to have your heads lifted up. One of you is going to be able to stand upright again and march back into the place of the king and have your old position back. The other of you is going to lift up your head and they're going to cut it off. <laughs> the one who went back to the king, Joseph said to him, Remember me before the king, Pharaoh. Well, years again passed. And Joseph, sold into slavery rotting in prison, is now there even longer. But then one day the king has a dream and nobody can interpret it. And so finally the cupbearer remembers, wait a minute, I remember, I remember this guy that knows how to interpret dreams. So they bring him before Pharaoh. And Joseph says, I can tell you what seven fat cows and seven skinny cows mean. Seven fat cows are seven years of plenty. Seven skinny cows are seven years of want and famine. And so here's what you need to do in these seven good years. Store up grain for yourselves so that you are ready to weather the next seven years. The king liked the advice, did as he said, and soon Joseph... Sold once as a slave, then a prisoner is now second in charge of all of Egypt. Incredible story. And so then famine hits. It hits not just Egypt, but it hits even Israel. And so God, or jo Jacob, sends his sons down to find grain. And suddenly, the ten sons of Leah walk in and meet Joseph. Except they don't know it's Joseph, right? They thought their brother was long gone. They didn't recognize him. He shaved his head. He looked like an Egyptian. And so they ask for grain, but Joseph immediately recognizes them. So he puts them to the test. He says, he tries to see what's happened to the other son of Rachel. Is he still alive? Have they treated him as poorly? He asked for them to bring them down. They do. And then Jake, or Joseph sets them up for a fall. When they leave, they leave with tons of grain, but in the bags that are given to Benjamin, his true full brother, the ones that are given to Benjamin, he sticks some royal goblets from the tables of Egypt. He lets them get a day away, then he sends his army after them. They find the goblets and things in Jake, Benjamin's possession. And so what happens? They bring him back. He's going to execute him, he says. But one of the brothers steps in and says, I cannot let my father be hurt again. He's already lost one favored son. Take me instead. And now the story changes. Now there is reunion. Now there is reconciliation. One of my favorite lines in all of Scripture is from the very end of Genesis. It says, 
Joseph finally said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God essentially to judge you, to put you to death? He says, even though you intended, he, he announces who he is. They know he's Joseph now and they're even more afraid. He says, even though you intended to do me harm, God intended it for good. So here we are at the end of Genesis. That's the story. And I want to make sense of it in our world just a little bit. So, first of all, we have our pattern. If only God had done this, if only God had done that. I think the main part of this part of the story is if only God had chosen one group of people and worked through them. I think God would say, I did. And it didn't very well work for the people, the children of Abraham, the people of Israel. And you know what? It probably doesn't work all the time really well for us, the church. Why? Because we are sinners. But what I want you to hear at the end of this day is that our brokenness. I mean, God chooses Abraham and he acts incredibly faithfully and then he turns around and tries to give away his wife and the promised land and have children with the maid. And that's our journey as humans. You know, here he goes through Isaac, and Isaac starts playing favorites. Jacob plays favorites. Joseph is probably the most honorable person we've come across here. He was a little prideful. <laughs> Eleven of you are going to be bowing down to me, and guess what they did? But God still uses sinners. And that's... That's kind of the message for today. You remember the second lesson that, that happens to be a sign that, that doesn't necessarily go right with this, but yet fits so perfectly for where we are in the hands of God? We hear in Romans 5, while we were still weak and at precisely the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person. Someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one who is good. No, not one. As part of this same argument in the book of Romans, we are broken people. And yet God comes to us and rescues us. In the midst of Jacob's runnings, he actually, God actually is probably the prefigured Christ. Christ probably came before he was ever born, before he was ever incarnate, and worshiped wrestled all night with Jacob, could have destroyed him, put his hip out of joint so that he would only limp from now on. But Jacob needed to quit running in his life. And so God disciplined him, but yet renamed him Israel. And so the line, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, really now, Jacob is the people of Israel. His 12 sons become the 12 tribes. God knows our brokenness. And he sees and knows and grieves for the brokenness of our world. Here we are in the midst of situations Essentially, the world intends things for evil, but God works them for good. I want to ask you something. At the time I'm recording this, a week or so early, uh, there are things that are going to go on between now and then that will be the new things in your headlines. 
the time I'm recording this, of course, COVID-19, the world, the brokenness of this world wreaks havoc. But how is God working that for good in your life? If you're not seeing it, come talk to me. Because God wants to bless you in the midst of these slowdowns and shutdowns and panic and fear. Uh, it'll be a couple weeks ago now, there was a, a racial murder. A police officer killed George Floyd. How is God going to take our broken lives? I said in a devotion that we sent out uh, a week or two ago that I said, the, the saddest hymn in all of Scripture might be, Ah, Holy Jesus. And the line that always gets me as it's singing about the crucifixion is, I crucified thee. How am I part of the systemic racism? How do I participate in other kinds of ways? When we look at pornography, we are actually complicit and causing young women to be enslaved. When we lie and cheat, we're cheating others of their livelihood and their good name. I remember going into a store one day, and it was just Mary Louise and I. We walked into the store. We were the only patrons. There were five people there. Four of them were working as security. One at the, the, the door, an armed security guard. One in the... Uh, changing rooms, one roaming the floor, watching us like a hawk. I mean, how much money do our little compromises cost this world? What we intend, rightly, wrongly, intentionally, unintentionally, for harm. God is there to reconcile it and turn it into good. If only God chose one group of people and worked through them. God says, I did, and it didn't work very well for Israel. And it doesn't always work really well for the church. Gracious God, we ask you to forgive us, to heal us, to turn our stories right side up. Lord, we have failed, but you continued to work through those like Abraham. Lord, let our end of the story be better than the middle of our story. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who, even while we were sinners, died for us. Thanks be to God. That's the story. Amen.